Hello world, thank you so much for coming to my talk. I'm going to be talking about building a large-scale threat intelligence system with OpenBSD. So first, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lawrence Teo. I've been an OpenBSD user since the year 2000. I believe that was OpenBSD 2.5 or 2.6. Um, that was when Puffy, the mascot, uh, first was uh, was first introduced to OpenBSD. I've also been an OpenBSD developer since 2012. Um, my username is LTEO. And um, in the beginning, um, I primarily worked on uh, things related to the network, such as libpcap, uh, TCP dump, divert, and um, others in that area. I've also been, um, I also help out with updating the Snort port, as well as uh, the Ghidra disassembler and other tools, and also involve myself in the release process um, in OpenBSD. I'm also the co-founder and vice president of development at Calytic Security, uh, which creates um, information security solutions for small businesses um, using OpenBSD. I obtained my PhD in information security from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where the title of my dissertation is Internet Scale, Intrusion Detection and Prevention. In that dissertation, I described a large scale information sharing framework that can be used to um, counter uh, emerging threats rapidly. I also, want to, I also like to stay up to date with um, offensive security techniques that are used by the adversary so I have taken um, certifications um, related to rate teaming, penetration testing, reverse engineering, and exploit development. Uh, that's my email address on the screen, as well as my Twitter handle, which is LTEO. Okay, so let's talk about um, OpenBSD and threat intelligence by first talking about a Lego brick. So you might be wondering like, why and what does a Lego brick have to do with um, OpenBSD and threat intelligence. Well, as we all know, Legos are a very popular toy uh, for both kids and adults, and um, they can be used to build all sorts of things. But they are also they also have a dark side. Uh, have you ever stepped on a Lego brick or a bunch of Lego bricks? Uh, that is extremely painful, and according to people who have done it. Uh, they say that stepping on Lego bricks is actually more painful than walking on fire. And I think that's so crazy, but it just illustrates how something that is small uh, can be used to inflict so much pain on someone. Um, so my goal with OpenBSD and threat intelligence is to use them to make the uh, threat actors and the adversaries uh, step on Lego bricks to make it so painful for them that they're not going to come back again. So this in this presentation, I'll talk about both OpenBSD and threat intelligence. But given that this is a BSD conference, I am certain that almost everybody knows what OpenBSD is. So I'll start with talking about uh, threat intelligence first. So what is cyber threat intelligence? Uh, if you Google this phrase, you'll find all sorts of definitions out there, from very simple definitions to very uh, complex ones. In this presentation, I'll use the definition from SANS, which simply states that cyber intelligence is analyzed information about the hostile intent, capability, and opportunity of an adversary that satisfies a requirement. So all of those three things um, that I've highlighted have to be there. Um, for it to be considered intelligence, hostile intent, capability, and opportunity. Um, intelligence is also actionable information. There is no such thing as non-actionable intelligence. So when intelligence is pre presented to the person who requested intelligence, it has to be actionable information. Uh, cyber threat intelligence is also a process, not just a finished product. It's not simply a blog post or a report or an email or a thread feed. Um, it is the entire process of uh, generating the intelligence also. So there are various models and frameworks for intrusion analysis that are useful for a threat intelligence. And I've listed four here. And the first has a diamond model, then there's MITRE ATT&CK, the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain, and the one from Verizon called Veris. 
Um, all these models are complementary of each other. And none of them have the full view of any intrusion or can be used to analyze an intrusion fully, but uh, they're they, they are all useful. Uh, as the quote I provided at the bottom says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. In trend intelligence, is also the intelligence cycle. Um, if you search for intelligence cycle, you also see various versions of it. The one that I've taken from here is from SANS as well, and it divides the intelligence cycle into five phases, uh, planning and direction, where we plan and gather the requirements of what we want the intelligence to tell us, I mean, what we want to find out via the intelligence, and collection is where we collect the data to, in the pro uh, as part of the process to get that intelligence then we process the data that we collected, and that is where we put data into various buckets, and um, and also to uh, do some data cleanup if necessary. Uh, next, we analyze the um, data that we've processed and produced intelligence, which we then disseminate back to the stakeholders and the people who have requested the intelligence. There are three types of threat intelligence strategic, operational, and tactical. So in the strategic threat intelligence, um, that is used for uh, to guide business direction. So it's basically intelligence in a business context. It's a high level you know, intelligence report that, or, or is different as a form of intelligence that's used to figure out what to do uh, with a business. In the operational phase, um, operational threat intelligence is used for things like uh, figuring out which activity groups are currently active in industry. And finally, tactical threat intelligence um, involves technical indicators, such as IP addresses and domains that are used by the threat actors, as well as behaviors such as network traffic, as well as host behaviors. So the goal of um, is to make it expensive for the adversary. Um, the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain is a model that has been around for a while, but it still applies today. Uh, so what the cyber, what the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain does is it shows the phases um, that the attacker has to do in order to compromise a network or a system. For example, um, they begin with a reconnaissance, then weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and finally, actions and objectives. The final phase could be something like deploying ransomware or exfiltrating data from the network, basically stealing confidential information and uh, sending that back to the attacker. Um, so the goal of the defender is to block um, any one of these uh, phases to frustrate the attacker and to basically make it expensive uh, for the attacker to complete their attack. So the, basically to let the attacker step on Lego bricks and not come back again. So let's talk about OpenBSD. Now OpenBSD is a great operating system that is great for many things. And I believe it's perfect for SMB firewalls. Um, first of all, it's secure by default. And also with the right setup and the uh, correct num uh, types of packages, OpenBSD can provide all the network security features and SMB needs. Um, now, firewalls, I consider them to be the first and last line in defense in most networks because they block inbound attacks. Um, that's the first line of defense, and they block outbound attacks uh, for something that's compromised. So that's the last line of defense. Um, and so sitting at the network edge uh, where um, you can see all network traffic um, is also a great point to be for a firewall because, um, like, Chris Benton of SANS uh, considers network monitoring to be the, the great equalizer because you can, um, because even if the attacker tries to hide traffic, um, sorry, even if the attacker tries to hide their activities on the endpoints, they still generate network traffic, which can be picked up by the firewall. So the, the network edge device uh, can, can see everything and therefore is a great equalizer. But beyond firewalling, um, in this presentation, I'll talk about how OpenBSD can be used as a threat intelligence gateway as well, 
which um, leverages threat intelligence to uh, perform policy enforcement as well as assist in incident response. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I co-founded Calytic Security. And the goal of Calytic Security is to develop, deliver a consolidated uh, security platform for small businesses and small organizations in general. So to date, uh, in the past 16 years, um, Calytix has deployed thousands of OpenBSD-based Unified Threat Management, or UTM, firewalls at SMBs across the US and Canada. Um, we, are also, we are also currently developing the Community Shield Threat Intelligence System, which we are, is the subject of this presentation, and uh, there's more to come as well. So the firewall that we deploy is called Access Enforcer. And in the beginning, it was a UTM firewall that provides many things an SMB needs. For example, a firewall, an IDS IPS, a web filter, VPN features, as well as provides Active Directory integration in Microsoft environments. Today, um, it has evolved to be a threat intelligence gateway and much more. So we have Community Shield, which I'll talk about. And there's also geographic filtering with Geofence. Gatekeeper, which is a multi-factor authentication technology. Uh, we also incorporate external thread feeds and uh, provide an event vault for off-site secure archive. Access Enforcer under the hood. Uh, we use OpenBSD and uh, lots and lots of PF. Uh, we use Snort as well for IDS IPS. And uh, many of the things that we do internally are inspired by OpenBSD. So um, we try to use randomness, for example. So we have used randomly generated passwords uh, since the very first unit. There's no default password in the Access Enforcer. Our development process is inspired by OpenBSD. And we have also been auto-upgrading Access Enforcer units in the field since the very, very first unit deployed in 2006. Um, and we've upgraded across OpenBSD releases, upgraded even from the i386 architecture over to AMD64 and so forth. Um, so we, we do all these things um, in a way that's purpose built for the um, small business. So why do we choose OpenBSD? Well, obviously security is the main um, objective because it's a firewall, we need to be as secure as possible. Uh, we also like PF a lot. Um, I'm sure like many of uh, you, um, my first exposure to OpenBSD was because I was messing with Linux IP tables and just, you know, it was just too complicated. So I switched to OpenBSD and used PF. So and I've had the privilege of using PF uh, for most of my career as well. And then BSD, the BSD and ISC license in OpenBSD is commercial friendly. So that was a big factor as well of, of why we use OpenBSD. And like I said, development practices are great. Uh, the documentation is great. And the very predictable release cycle of two releases a year helps us plan our development. And that has been a very consistent uh, release cycle for 25 years now on OpenBSD's part. And uh, lastly, the ports and packages are, have, uh, there's a wide array of them to allow us to um, deploy the things that we want without a lot of work on our part. So this slide shows all the various exploit mitigation techniques on OpenBSD, and um, is also another big reason why we use OpenBSD. And there are very, very few systems that have this many mitigation techniques all on one system and all enabled by default. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the SMB customers that we serve. So these SMB customers that we serve um, are, you know, small businesses, for example, accountants, lawyers, eye doctors, dentists, but they also involve uh, small organizations um, such as schools, fire stations, and so forth. These SMB customers tend to have limited resources in terms of budget and staff size, and also a limited awareness of cybersecurity issues. Um, but thankfully, this is changing um, with, uh, with ransomware being in the news, as well as um, compliance requirements and uh, cyber insurance um, requirements and so forth. Um, SMB uh, firms are more aware of cybersecurity today than they were before. 
Um, because SMBs have limited IT staff, they tend to use outside consulting firms or called managed service providers or MSPs. And there are many MSPs out there that they provide various levels of response. And, uh, and the SMB customers that we have are involved in various industries. Um, like I mentioned earlier, accounting, um, you know, professional services, education, retail, healthcare, and so forth. And because they're so diverse, they, um, these are not homogeneous environments. They use all sorts of different servers, technologies, and so forth. And also we do not control the environments. So these are some of the challenges that we have to overcome in order to uh, provide them with the security that they need. So let's talk a little bit about the managed service provider or the MSP. So the MSP provides various services for the small business, for example, uh, platform software and ID infrastructure services. They help improve the business process and the SMB. And of course, they provide uh, cybersecurity services as well. MSVs play a very important role uh, for SMBs because they allow the SMB to focus on their core mission without needing to expand their IT staff. So the MSB takes care of the network and the technologies, and then the SMB can concentrate on what they're good at. And then MSB usually manages their clients using a remote monitoring and management tool, uh, frequently called RMM uh, in the MSB world. Now, one MSB typically helps uh, many different um, SMB customers. So MSB technicians have a lot to deal with every day. And so a big uh, problem that they face is alert fatigue when they get so many alerts every day. Uh, so our goal here is to make it easy for them to reduce the noise. Um, to quote one of our best customers, he said, oh, wake me up only if I have to. Don't wake me up if it's not important, basically. But if it's really important, yes, do get me up so that I can take care of the problem of the security issue. So OMDC and Cybertrain Intelligence can help here because um, we can help them prioritize alerts and so forth. And um, another in interesting thing about SMBs and MSPs is that um, because they are relatively small compared to a large organization, like unlike a large organization that has thousands and thousands of endpoints, an SMB typically has anywhere from 10 to 50 or 100 endpoints. And therefore, um, we can be more, we can afford to be a little bit more aggressive with the SMB in terms of um, applying filtering and policy enforcement and so forth. So there's very little red tape to deal with when um, uh, enforcing policies. So here's what a typical SMB network looks like. Um, obviously, there's a firewall in the middle, but behind a firewall are all sorts of things like you know, cameras, wireless systems, domain controllers, workstations, phones, printers, point and sale systems, and there may be other things as well. For example, conference TVs, x-ray machines, specialist equipment, all sorts of things. And many of these things need to connect to the internet. So, and they provide a target-rich environment for the threat actor also. Uh, there are also remote users who connect to the SMB. And, uh, and some SMBs have cloud services that they use also. Uh, and MSB typically manages this environment using their RMM tool. And some of the challenges that we face in the SMB network are things like the default allow policy, um, and the use of RDP um, everywhere, which is a very difficult thing to deal with. And also um, open ports, um, often for things that do not um, need to have an open port, but there's a port forwarding rule that's used for it anyway. So those are some of the challenges. So, um, so, then, so like I said, RDP is a challenge uh, because it, especially when it's allowed, um, basically, especially if RDP is exposed to the public internet, but this is a frequent uh, configuration or a, you know, maybe a misconfiguration in uh, many uh, SMB networks uh, because the attacker can use this to, you know, um, brute force logins and do dictionary attacks. And once they get in, they can do all sorts of bad things like deploy ransomware and so forth. Like some, you know, I mean, a joke in security says that RDP stands for ransomware deployment protocol. But there's some truth to that because it is used for deploying ransomware. 
So in February of 2020, which is basically the month before everything changed, at least in the USA, um, at Calyptix, we did an internal study um, to, on our customer data set. So we analyzed the RDB traffic that's going to our SMB customers that are on non-standard ports. And we chose non-standard ports because um, that is less indicative of a legitimate uh, RDP connection. And also, um, yeah, I mean, that was the main reason, but um, of course, it's also SMB customers who do use uh, non-standard ports for the RDP connections also. But the primary goal here is to analyze the, the bad traffic. So uh, we had, um, from a data set, we found 79 million events, or basically 79 million RDP connections generated by 5,600 IP addresses from all over the world. And 62% of these events are from Russia alone. That's almost 50 million events. Uh, this is followed by the USA, 11%. But the USA bucket uh, typically has false positives in it because most of our customers are from the USA anyway, and some of them do have a legitimate reason for connecting via RDP. And that's followed by Germany, uh, China, the Netherlands, France, and so forth. So based on this, uh, we use this as a strategic trend intelligence um, information to guide uh, the business direction. And our goal here is to reduce the amount of RDP attempts and other um, bad attacks uh, that might be coming in uh, to our customers, basically to reduce the attack surface of our customers. So we did this in three steps. In step one, we performed geographic filtering in our uh, product we call this geofence and we took advantage of the fact that most of our SMB locations are located in the US and Canada in fact almost all of them so by since these are typically small businesses without any um, business relationships with countries outside the US and Canada um, many of our customers can choose to um, allow just the US and Canada uh, to perform inbound connections to their network. So Geofence was implemented using PF and uh, specifically using PF tables. And some of the challenges that we face here are when we hit PF table limits, especially if a customer is trying to, um, for example, block way too many countries and uh, that generates a lot of entries in the PF table. So. In those cases, we have to advise a customer to like, instead of blocking many countries, you know, to just allow a few countries. And then some point in the future, we can optimize that in the code also. Uh, the next thing that we did based on the uh, internal study that we did was to shield RDP from public exposure. Uh, the system or uh, the feature that we used, that we implemented for doing this is called Gatekeeper. And what Gatekeeper does is it provides multi-factor authentication for RDP, but in later versions, we added support for SSH, HTTPS, and VNC. So in Gatekeeper, the user gets to log in to a web interface, and that goes through the two-factor process, and then they're presented with a list of devices they're authorized to connect to, like basically, for example, their workstation that can RDP to. So this was implemented using um, PF1's rules. And if you're not familiar with what a PF1's rule is, um, it's basically a one-shot rule where when you create a rule, once a packet matches that rule and a state is created, that rule is deleted and it's, um, yeah, that basically is gone. So this is great for creating temporary uh, authorizations like in the case of Gatekeeper. We also um, leveraged threat intelligence as a next step, and this is where we built Community Shield to, again, reduce the attack surface of our customers. So Community Shield is both a cyber threat intelligence producer and consumer. The goal is to reduce attacks, and also and its goal is to uh, distribute tactical threat intelligence in the form of um, threat feeds and also other forms of intelligence, such as notifications, and we'll get into that later. Um, this little chart here shows the effectiveness of Community Shield and also Gatekeeper. 
Um, in the beginning, we had about 15 or so average uh, uh, events per day. I mean, average percent of sites attacked per day in terms of failed logins. And then um, with the introduction of Geofence and Gatekeeper, they dropped to about maybe 7.5 or so. And then finally, um, with Community Shield, uh, they dropped to just four per day. Um, so <clears throat> that uh, that shows the uh, effectiveness of leveraging threat intelligence as well as geographic filtering and shielding RDP from public exposure. So now, now let's talk about Community Shield. Um, and I'll talk about Community Shield in the context of the threat intelligence cycle. So first, um, the first thing in the threat intelligence cycle is the planning and direction phase. And so we're here we discuss the requirements in this case of the goals of Community Shield. So the first is to share information, like basically if some threats are found in one unit, uh, share that with the other units and reducing the attack to surface is a key goal here also, uh, where we want to block inbound connection attempts from the sources of threats that we have identified previously. Uh, then we also want to detect intrusions that the user is unaware of, and also to prioritize, prioritize alerts, which is to reduce alert fatigue so that the MSP technician is not overwhelmed. And by doing all this, we hope to drive operational changes in the SMB um, by making them aware of misconfigurations in the network that could be allowing these attacks to occur so that they can change those configurations and fix them to prevent um, the attacker from coming in in the future. And the goal is to do all these things in a secure and automated way. So the, on a very high level, this is how Community Shield works. Uh, so First of all, we have the access enforcers at the bottom, and that's for data collection. And here's where we collect data. And after the data is collected, we forward them to an event aggregation layer. And the event aggregation layer, treasure, treasure data and data cleaning are part of the processing phase uh, of the threat intelligence cycle. So event aggregation layer adds more information and data, and then forwards that onto our data warehouse called treasure data. And from treasure data, we use queries to query treasure data down to our system where we clean it up uh, to remove various things. And next, we move to analysis where we analyze the data that has been cleaned up. And then the results in analysis are a few, like we have the C2 monitor, which looks for command and control traffic. And we use that information to report such incidents to the MSP so that they're aware of it. Uh, we also have an outbound activity notification generator, which informs the MSB about any malicious outbound connections that we find. Um, we also use the analysis to phase to um, <clears throat> design our feed generator, which creates various um, thread feeds and so forth that are then deployed, send the deployment server. Uh, along with some external thread feeds, and that is sent back to the uh, access enforcers. So OpenBSD is used in these parts of the community shield. So it's used on the access enforcers. It's also used in the data cleaning phase. Um, it's used as part of analysis. It's also used in um, the notification generator, as well as the feed generator, and uh, also the deployment server. Now, even though this, con this presentation is about OpenBSD, um, there's also FreeBSD in here as well. Um, FreeBSD is used in the event aggregation layer along with Debian Linux. The event aggregation layer is 50-50 Debian and FreeBSD right now. And the goal here is to move to 100% FreeBSD at some point. And uh, C2 Monitor is uh, implemented using uh, Power BI, which is by Microsoft. And now let's talk about collection. Um, the things that we collect are on the accent posters are thing, you know, things from PF, Snort, the web filters, VPN, SSH logins, and so forth. And we have parsers that parse the logs and package them to event log messages that are then forwarded to the event aggregation layer using a software called FluentD. So here's how it looks like. 
So we have various logs, including PF log devices, and these are uh, sent to a custom parser, or rather the custom parser reads this log and parses them, and then sends them via syslog to the events log. Uh, there are certain other modules that write directly to the event log also. Then FluentD uh, constantly monitors the event log to create a JSON based, I'm sorry, that then it basically spools this information and sends it to the event aggregation layer that is then sent the treasure data. In terms of the things that we need to consider when collecting data, um, first we got to make sure that the timestamps are correct. So we keep them synced with OpenBSD's NTPD, uh, basically a network time daemon. And all timestamps are done using UTC. This is very important because all our units are spread across various time zones. Um, deciding what to log is also very important because we can't possibly log everything that will um, create way too much traffic and many too much events. And um, dealing with internet outages is important for us as well because um, an SMB um, is not guaranteed to have a really, really reliable ISP every time. Uh, so the nice thing about FluentD is that it can pick up where it left off when the internet comes back. And security is also very important, and FluentD helps us here as well by, al by allowing a secure connection to the um, event aggregation layer uh, using a reliable TCP stream also. The event log message is a key pair, key value pair um, list in JSON. Um, so here's how it looks like. And there are two types of fields. Um, there are standard fields that are used um, for all event log messages, and these are things like the access and fossil version and the serial number. Um, Module-specific fields are things that are specific to the module. Like in this case, the module is uh, PF alert, and um, in PF alert, we have things like um, destination IP, destination port, and so forth, um, and the protocol. In other um, field in other modules like the login monitor and those who have usernames and the web the filter module we have like you know domain name and so forth so depending on the module the event log message could be different and later in the processing phase um, we'll talk about the event aggregation fields that are added also so um, yeah so let's move on to the processing phase in the processing phase, the goal here is to put some data in the buckets. And um, the event aggregation layer is a set of geographically distributed servers that receive all this data from the access enforcers, and then they add um, more fields to those event log messages, such as the ASN organization of the source IPs, or more geographic data, as well as site account information. These are things that the access enforcers themselves do not have access to, or it could be they it could be that they don't have access to it, or it's difficult for them to get it. But it's easier to do this in the event aggregation layer. So it's done here. And the software that runs an event aggregation layer is also fluent D. And from there, um, the data the, after all these things are appended. Uh, the data is then uh, forwarded to Treasure Data, which is a data warehouse. And over here, um, the Treasure Data provides the Hive and Presto uh, query engines that allow us to perform SQL-like queries on um, the, data, the data that is stored in Treasure Data. Uh, at the moment, we're currently storing up to 12 months of data. And um, Treasure Data is great for batch processing that data. Uh, the processing phase also involves uh, cleaning up the data. For example, to remove RFC-1989 IPs, as well as any known IPs, like for example, public DNS servers. We learned this the hard way when the DNS server for a public for a popular ISP ended up uh, on the list uh, from an external thread feed. And so uh, now we make sure that we always um, exclude that. And then we also remove any false positive IPs that have been previously reported by, via the support team. And also any known scanners such as um, census. These are like internet scanners that scan the internet all the time. 
and they just create noise, so there's no need to keep that information. We also remove IPs from snort alerts that are triggered by high false positive snort rules, like, for example, a shell code snort rule that could create too much false positives. So in those cases, we remove those IPs. So graphically, here's how it looks like. Uh, first of all, the access enforcer collects the data, sends it to event aggregation, and then on the treasure data, then, then we do the data cleanup, where we remove all the things that we don't want, and then we forward it to analysis. So now we reach the analysis and production phase. So our current load in terms of the events that we get per day is like 120 to 470 million events per day. That's a lot of events to sift through manually. So we use a combination of an automated and manual approach. The analysis goals here are to monitor for C2, as well as malicious outbound connections, and also to create community shield uh, thread feeds that can be disseminated back to the access enforcer units. So graphically, here's how it looks like. Uh, after the processing is done, uh, we get the data, and then um, we have programs that monitor C2 activity, uh, and also programs that identify malicious outbound connections. And finally, um, <clears throat> We are constantly looking at the process data to create and improve our community shield feeds. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why monitoring outbound activity is important. So by malicious outbound activity, what I mean here are outbound activity from internal machines to the IPs and the thread feeds. So if an IP address has ended up in a community shield feed, it's usually because it's bad for some reason. And but if we find that an endpoint in an SMB network is connecting to that IP in the thread feed, that is even more suspicious. So that is usually uh, indicative of malicious activity. So we want to flag these IPs and um, make them known to the MSP technician so that they can take care of it before uh, it becomes worse. And uh, once some of the things we use to uh, lessen the false positives here are to cross-check the IP against other sources like uh, API Void, uh, Web Root Bright Cloud Threat Intelligence Services, and so forth. Um, we also calculate a threat score for every network site, uh, where every site gets a score of 1 to 5, and the IPs that we identified get a reputation score of 1 to 100. So from this analysis and so forth, uh, we have developed uh, seven uh, community shield thread feeds that look at all sorts of things. Um, so the, for example, the intrusion and exploitation IPs um, thread feed looks at um, malware IPs for malware, Trojans, exploits, and other malicious attack activity. And failed logins are from failed logins from you know, SSH, the access enforcer, user interface, gatekeeper, and our VPN, uh, there's this RDP probes. Uh, suspicious US IP is an interesting one. Like, like I said earlier, uh, most of our SMB customers are in the US and Canada. And so they do not need to get uh, inbound connection attempts from countries outside the US and Canada. However, we also have a small subset of customers who are basically home networks in the USA. And in these cases, these are not managed by MSBs and they don't need any inbound connections uh, to them, even from the USA. So the, the interesting thing about these um, systems is that we can turn on geofence to block everything, like even the USA. But the moment we receive an inbound connection attempt from the US-based IP, then that's when we know that this is unusual and then so this helps to capture uh, suspicious US IPs from USA, basically. And, um, and this tries, we try to use this feed to, um, to lessen the attack surface even more for everybody. The Log4j Active Exploitation um, feed is used to identify IPs that uh, try to exploit Log4j using the Log4Shell vulnerability. And then we also have the international super scanners feed, uh, like the name implies. These are scanners that are like extremely persistent and generate a lot of noise 
uh, and these are based outside the USA. So these are that's that's also a feed that is very useful. So we are constantly monitoring our thread feeds. Um, so this one here shows the number of distinct IPs um, that generate inbound and outbound community shield alerts for the past thirty days. So we I monitor the trends and see what's going on and use this to refine our feeds or to, or, you know, to find out if something is wrong that we need to look into. Uh, and community issue events um, are also monitored. Uh, so this one here shows the inbound and outbound alerts generated by a community shield thread feed in the last uh, 30 days. So, by, so it's always an iterative process where we create a feed analyze the results and then use the results and any false positives reported by our support team to refine the feeds to get to make it better and better. So lastly, we reach a dissemination phase. And in this phase, uh, this involves a few things. First, we deliver an OpenBSD package containing the community shield thread feeds to the access enforcer unit so that it can apply those feeds and block those IPs that have been identified. Um, we also deliver the email notification of C2 activity or command and control activity to affected MSPs. This is done every 30 minutes. And um, lastly, we deliver the notification of the malicious outbound activity to the affected ISP, to the affected MSPs. And this is done every 24 hours. So this is how it looks like after we analyze them. Um, any C2 activity is emailed to the MSP. Malicious outbound activity is the meaning of the MSD also. And then, you know, we have a feed generator that generates the various feeds that we we'll talked about. And that is packaged using a deployment server, uh, which is also runs on OpenBSD. That creates an OpenBSD package that is then sent to the access enforcer. So now let's take a look at what goes on inside the access enforcer after it receives that OpenBSD package. So now this is not exactly how it looks like in our actual code, but the concepts are similar. Uh, so this is how you do what we do to dynamically load uh, new PF rules based on the feed that we just received. So we have, let's say, a file called dynamic rules um, PGZ. It's a package that can that you can install using package add. So then uh, within that package are files like the dynamic rules file that that contains the PF rules that we want to load. Uh, then we have the um, a table of field logins. This is like a list of IPs um, that we have identified to be part of the field logins feed, suspicious US IPs and so forth. And then we use the exact um, parameter to load those dynamic rules into your memory. So basically when that package is installed, then you know we basically cat the dynamic rules file and pipe it to PF control, which loads that in the dynamic rules anchor. And the dynamic rules anchor is in the part of pf.conf. The nice thing about PF anchors is that you can use them to load new rules into your rule set without affecting the rest of the rule set. So on the on the typical access enforcer, we have a lot of PF rules uh, for all sorts of things. But, um, but by using PF anchors, uh, we can load just the community shield stuff um, just in that part of the rule set without having to refresh the entire rule set. So that's a really nice thing to do with our PF anchors. So this is what the PF rules look like. Um, now, in the, in the real thing, is a lot more complicated than this, but I just wanted to show a brief highlight of uh, what, what we do. Uh, so we have the, a table uh, that we load the, that we use to load the, um, the failed logins file. It looks like I suddenly missed out a code here. It's supposed to be a code there. And then, um, then we have two um, PF rules. One is used to block inbound connections from um, IPs within that table. And then one is used to block outbound um, connections uh, from any IPs going to IPs in that table. So this outbound block rule uh, is used to as a source of the malicious outbound activity notifications that I talked about earlier. And using the log uh, parameter here, we can log this, any alerts that trigger from these rules 
and do a PF log instance. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, you can set up PF log B to uh, read this, and then um, then you also have a file that you can use TCP dump to read from to identify if anything has um, has triggered based on that rule. But the question is, like, if you have multiple modules, like, then what do you do? Like, how do you differentiate one type of um, like how do you know which rule created uh, what alert? So to do that, uh, we use different PF log devices. Um, and so basically you can create, in this example, I created two PF log devices, one called PF log 1001, and the next one is called PF log 1002. And so for the failed logins uh, feed, for example, I could say block return in log to PF log 1001, and then this is blocked from the failed logins table. And for geofence, I log you know, based on PF log 1002, and this comes from the geofence table. So then, then our then my our custom parsers can read from the um, specific PF log device and know um, which rule triggered that alert. Another important thing to do um, when deploying a system like this is to address false positives. So the system is not perfect. Sometimes, you know, things end up in the list when it's not supposed to, like that, for example, that ISP's DNS server that I talked about. And so we need to find a way to let the customer remediate it um, quickly. And the way we do it, like, of, there's a user interface that allows them to enter the IP. But internally, we use PF tagging to allow that um, traffic. Like for example, in this case, you know, we say pass in an egress from the allowed IP, and then we tag it with the PF tag called allow list. And then within our PF rule that I wrote earlier, I can now add this part here that says only apply this block if um, the allow list PF tag is not present. So any connections from that allowed IP, um, and along with any other criteria, like you know, we can say tag it allow list, and then so they will not fall into this, they will not be matched by this block rule if um, the PF if the allow list PF tag is present. So here's a quick view of how our malicious outbound activity notification looks like. Um, so it shows the um, so this is what the MSB technician will receive uh, when there's like a malicious outbound activity that happens in the network. So first it will show the IP address that their internal machine was trying to connect to along the ASN information. And then we'll show the, then we cross check it with various other threat intelligence services. And then finally we calculate an IP threat score to tell them like, uh, you know, basically to suggest whether they should um, uh, like basically where they should look into it further and how confident we are with it. Then we also show the actual endpoint IP that was trying to connect to the external IP. So in this case, we show this source IP is trying to connect out to these IPs. These are the ASNs and you know, first seen, last seen, um, the duration, how long they've been doing this and how many attempts like this one here as you know, there's 500,000 attempts. So if that one is, if that IP is in the in the various thread feeds, along with our own, um, 500,000 attempts to that IP, that that could be something that they really they should look into. Perhaps like a infected machine or a command and control thing that's going on. So some interesting findings that we found, uh, apart from the regular infections, we have found cameras um, calling home to countries like China, Singapore, and Ireland. Um, so we don't, don't really know what they're sending back there, but they are. And, um, and again, these are small businesses with, um, with no business relationship with those countries. So a camera calling home to those countries persistently is usually indicative that something weird is going on. We also found that snort rules that, um, there are shell, basically the shell cook based snort rules are responsible for many, uh, false positive instances. Um, especially when Microsoft updates were being downloaded or deployed. 
And this is not surprising because in exploits and shell codes, then you have long byte patterns or short byte patterns. And sometimes, coincidentally, Microsoft updates also have those same byte patterns and they end up matching and then, you know, end up with the Microsoft IP on their thread feed. Um, and then uh, sanitizing results against known scanner IPs or any IPs is critical, like the, the public DNS servers that I mentioned. And finally, um, we found that the failed logins, recon, and suspicious US IPs feeds are best for picking up actively malicious IPs. And we determined this based on an average of the Calytics IP threat score, as well as the WebRoot Bright Cloud Threat Intelligence Services IP reputation. Uh, we have also created a log4j or log4shell dashboard um, that's online, uh, that's created from Community Shield. And the URL is provided in that on the slide. And this, this is an interactive dashboard that if you have any interest in log4j, log4shell stuff, and feel free to play with it. Um, and it's updated um, very frequently. So now I'll talk a little bit about the challenges that we face. Um, I already talked about the PF table limits earlier when someone loads up too many things into the PF table from a geofence configuration. And we found that if a PF table is overloaded, the system can exhibit really weird behavior. So we're trying to like overcome that by optimizing our ranges even more. Uh, and then if you're and keeping up with the OpenBSD upgrade cycle is also a challenge. Now, the great thing about OpenBSD is that there's you know two releases per year. The challenging thing about OpenBSD is that there are two releases a year. So sometimes um, when our business activities don't match the OpenBSD release cycle, then it's hard to keep up. So that's an ongoing thing that we're always working on. Um, but we try to keep up as much as possible. And then um, when we have new hardware um, from our vendor, uh, that is also uh, occasionally uh, we run the issues where uh, OpenBSC would not load on the hardware, and because um, yeah, because it's new hardware and like it needs new drivers or new things. Like just to give an example, um, uh, back in 2019, I think we had like. A, a new hardware appliance that wouldn't load because of ACPI issues. And I actually brought that device to an OpenBSD hackathon and hacked on it there um, for about three or four days. Um, did I know anything about ACPI back then? Uh, absolutely not, like nothing whatsoever. But, um, but I had to, basically I crammed through three days of hacking and with help from the ACPI developers at the OpenDS hackathon, I was able to get the hardware going, and now uh, we're shipping that um, to our customers. And uh, lastly, a snort and divert is also a challenge. Uh, when snort is in IPS mode, uh, we use divert to, which is a feature in OpenBSD that trend, uh, redirects, basically that diverts packets from kernel to user space and back. And that um, currently is a very limited feature that um, does not work well in certain conditions, like for example, when there's multiple egress interfaces or when the SMB customer has multiple ISPs, for example, then that's challenging to work on. So it's still something that we're working on. So next steps, we're gonna try to reduce logging from the scanners even more, like those known scanners. Uh, we're also planning to develop more thread feeds and improve our data collection and right now, so we're working on a thorough document to provide more guidance to our MSPs on what to do after an incident. And we are constantly optimizing for a faster response to uh, malicious activities. Uh, finally, well, we're also working on notif uh, basically brainstorming ways to notify collaborative or friendly ASN organizations to automate abuse notifications if we find um, IP addresses that originate from those ASN organizations. So uh, finally, I want to leave you with a few things. Um, if you're interested in building your own OpenBSD-based solution, here are a few tips and ideas. Uh, first is to know your users. Um, if, like, if your users are used to, a, you know, let's say a graphical environment like ours are, then in our case, we build a web-based user interface and um, they don't have to do command line at all. 
Oh, also know your environment. Um, in our case, um, our customers are primarily US and Canada based small businesses with no business relationships with um, international. I mean, th there's no international business relationships with other countries. So we can leverage things like geographic filtering and perform very aggressive geographic um, filtering policies uh, because the environment is suited for that. Um, I also encourage everyone to study the OpenBSD development process. Um, there's a very, um, OpenBSD has been again, you know, releasing quality releases for 25 or more years now. And um, it uses a very thorough review process and high quality code. So there's a lot that we can learn from there to write a commercial code. And where possible, participate in the OpenBSD development process and give back any improvements, uh, whether it's in base or ports or documentation. And, um, but most, again, one really important thing is to keep up with the upgrade cycle. Um, don't fall behind, otherwise it will be very difficult. Uh, for anyone who's interested in cyber threat intelligence, I highly recommend Katie Nichols' article on called Cyber Threat Intelligence Self-Study Plan. Uh, in it, she lists all the free resources. There's some paid as well, but mostly free resources that you can use to uh, study threat intelligence. Um, also look up Diamond Model, Mindra Attack, and the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain. There's also a SANS course called Cyber Threat Intelligence. Um, I have not taken this course, but I've only heard good things about it. And finally, SANS hosts a CTI summit, usually in uh, January. Uh, during the last three years, because of the pandemic, uh, this has been virtual and free. So it's usually costs a lot of money, but, um, but since you can attend it virtually for free, uh, that's very high value content for you. So in summary, uh, this talk, I described a threat intelligence system that was built with OpenBSD. Uh, our goal is to help SMBs and MSBs re um, to reduce the cost of defense through shared intelligence and to make it really expensive to the adversary. We want to offset economics, make things cheaper to defend, more expensive to attack, and um, also you know, make the adversary step on Legos, basically, and make, it, make them step hard. <laughs> All right, so with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, again, my name is Lawrence Teo. That's my email address. My Twitter is LTEO. I'm on LinkedIn as well. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much for attending my talk, and I hope you have a great day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, uh, so thank you so much again for um, attending my talk. Um, so there was one question uh, on the BSD CAN stream about from Double P about whether um, I have evaluated uh, Suricata for performance in OpenBSD. Uh, so far, I have not um, done that, uh, but it's on the list <laughs> of the many, many things that I want to look at. Uh, so yeah, so not yet at the moment, but it's on the list. Uh, another question from Tron Double D, who asks if I've uh, found OpenBSD performance or network throughput to be a problem anywhere. Um, well, there's this basically in some cases. Um, well, most of this in, in my environment, where most of our customers are small businesses with um, with connections that are not very high speed. For example, you know, at most they would get, get a gig. Uh, gigabits per second, like one gigabit per second, but not more. And these are all USA based. Uh, so, so far it has been okay. Um, there's been, um, it, it also depends on the types of filters that they turn on. Like um, if they turn on a lot of filters, then then we advise them to get a bigger unit. Um, so it just depends on their configuration and the model that they chose. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so there's like, generally it has not been a problem for our, um, for our set of customers. Um, 
but it also, it also depends on the uh, filters that I turn on. So, okay, I think those are the only questions uh, that has been asked. Um, if, if again, if you need to um, follow up, just feel free to email me or send me a tweet or on LinkedIn. I'll be glad to answer any more questions. Uh, just a final note. Um, I just want to thank you all again for attending my talk and also want to thank the Calytics team, um, especially Ben Yarborough, Bryce Chidester, and India Thomas for their contributions to this presentation. I'd also like to thank uh, Joseph Schmidt for editing the video, or the OpenBSD team for OpenBSD, our MSV partners and our SMB customers. I want to thank Katie Nichols for her comprehensive CTI study plan, the Cyber Threat Intelligence Community, and lastly, I want to thank my family as well. Um, all right. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye.